when he saved me, he'd done a lot. I mean, he, he had his hands full, but he still <clears throat> thinks I'm worthy, even though I don't feel worthy, but he's worthy. He's worthy of my praise. He's going on with me and my family over the past several months and, you know, with the world and everything, but um, it's, it's been very good, um, I believe, even though it was hard, like, my, I, right before everything happened, I got a new position at my job. I became a salesperson. And uh, I was in that job for three weeks when all of a sudden everything stops. And you know, there's no one to sell to. There's, there's no one at our store. There's nothing. We are empty. Like, I don't know if you went to the mall during that time. Probably not because we were empty. It was so crazy. And uh, I was like, oh no. You know, I'm a salesperson and there's no one to sell to, but thankfully before that I had already been working in shipping, so they just, instead of furloughing me, I got moved to shipping. So I kept my job long past when a lot of other people were furloughed, and then it closed, but it was, we were only closed for like three weeks, and then they called me right back, and I came back, um, and I, we were so busy. We had so many people, and we didn't have enough people to work, and it was crazy and it was hard um, because like I would have like five or six people all demanding my attention and I'm only one person and there's like nobody else on the floor but me <laughs> and I'm just keep it up, just doing what I can. But uh, things have kind of settled down a little bit. We're still very busy, but we have more people to handle how busy we are. Um, but in that, I, got to know my bosses really well because it was my bosses and me and a few other people. I think by the end of it, there was like 17 of us in that store. And um, I, after everything calmed down and we got more people, I finally went in there and I was like, hey, can I have Sundays off? Um, and they just said, yeah, sure. Okay, we can do that which they don't give anybody Sundays off. So you don't get Sundays off in re retail when they work you on Sunday, but they gave it to me. They just said, you know, I, I couldn't, I don't really say that I have Sundays off. I just don't talk about it <laughs> so that other people, you know, don't get upset. And I'm just like, okay, I just won't even mention it, but I have Sundays off. And so I, for a while there, I didn't say it. If you've noticed, I've been here every Sunday um, because I didn't want it I wanted it to settle and be consistent because at any point you can just stop. It's not in writing, it's not something they have to do, it's something that they're doing for me. And I'm very thankful for that and it's been a blessing. And, and then they started, our, our sales started counting again. For a while there our sales weren't counting and we didn't have to, we have to get so many people to sign up for credit cards in, a, in the month. And for a while there, that didn't count. And I don't really like doing, I'm not the kind of person that makes people buy stuff. Like I'm the kind of person that I'll be like, you don't want that. You should probably not buy that. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm bad to myself or I'm like, I, don't, I won't ask people if you want a credit card. Like you were supposed to ask every single person. I won't ask. But God has given me consistent sales. I have not been in trouble for having low sales. I've had very high sales this entire time. Um, and then every single week, we have to get one a week or a month, one a week. Every single week, God has given me somebody who just really wants a credit, who really wants a credit card. And I haven't asked anyone. And he's every single week, he's giving me one person and that's all I need to just stay afloat and not be in trouble. And it has been wonderful and I am so blessed and I'm so happy and it just, like every single time, like it's crazy because like so many people struggle to get a credit app and I don't even ask and God just gives me one and I know it's God because I don't ask and it's so wonderful and I'm just so grateful that he's kept me and my family and all of us under his protection this entire time and it's scary and it's hard but I have hope, <laughs> and it's wonderful.
pocket. Anyway, I uh, appreciate it. I wanted to say again how much I appreciated the men, the work day we had yesterday, and what all was accomplished. And then I uh, think almost everyone was here, but I did mention, I think probably everyone knows that Brother Shelby Weaver passed away yesterday. We certainly are grieved about that. Loved Brother Weaver. And, and uh, the doctor said his heart just gave out. He just was wore out. He had two bouts of pneumonia. And, of course, he, the second time he went in the hospital, he tested positive for coronavirus. <clears throat> but he already had pneumonia and was uh, just already weak. And so he just couldn't pull out of it. Uh, but I did mention that I was able to talk to him on the phone before he went on the respirator and and I was able to you know just go over things with him concerning you know getting your heart ready and clear before the Lord in case you know he didn't pull out of it and uh, he was very receptive and and uh, so we appreciated that you need to pray for the family I don't know anything as of right now about any plans for, you know, it's going to be a left up to the family about what they're going to do about a funeral. And, and really, there's just one son, I think he's in Seattle, that really has any contact with him. So so I, I don't know. It's just up in the air right now. We just have to see. But we need to pray for the family. And, of course, Brother uh, Shelby's uh, current uh, personal situations that, you know, he owned a business, and there's, I'm sure there's a lot of things that has to be taken care of, and I'm not sure that he had a, a will. In fact, I'm almost sure he didn't. But anyway, so keep him in your prayers. Of course, Brother Ray and Sister Susan, they both are not very well, and they had not been in church hardly at all during this coronavirus deal, so I know they still need our prayers. <clears throat> Brother Wallace, yes, he just, he hadn't been doing well of late, and we need to keep him in our prayers. And the Mac Fees, of course, they went through the death of her sister and, and all, and so uh, keep them in your prayers. I think Sister Donna and Sister uh, Ann are both out of town today. Uh, they did, somebody told me, but... <laughs> Anyway, yeah, there was some issue that they had with one of her family members. It was the reason she was plan they were planning on going out of town at some time this week. But anyway, um, who else am I missing? The the Craftons. I hadn't heard from the Craftons today. They always let me know, and unless there's a, well, I don't think I've got a text. Sister uh, Ann Thompson's out of town today. I didn't know that. Uh, uh, Sister Smith's been sick this week some, too. She's got some kind of, she gets a tingling in her face and, uh, and real weak. She's been weak and had a couple, two or three days of that. She was bad her some yesterday, but she still was a little bit sick. And then she, we had a female uh, start having puppies about 6.15 or so last night. And she just, you know, sometimes this happens. I remember we had a female one time, took her 14 hours to have a litter of puppies, or longer, actually. She had 14 puppies is what it was. And she had, it just took her forever to have them. Well, uh, and delivered the first puppy about 6.15 last night. And the seventh puppy was born at 6.30 this morning. And Sister Gail took over at 7.30 and let Sister Smith come to bed.
did have the eighth puppy, Sister Gail did, about maybe eight or so. I don't know, there still may be one more, but anyway, that's the last I heard of it. Uh, so Sister Smith's been up all night, 12 hours or so, delivering, 13 hours, delivering puppies. So when she went to bed, I would say when about two minutes after her head hit the pillow, she was gone. <laughs> and uh, so then I mentioned to everyone that Brother Bud, John Bud, called me this morning when I walked in the church door and his assistant pastor, Brother Dennis White, his wife Pam, Sister Pam, tested positive for corona. And then uh, her niece, which is in the church, Brother Jake and Sister Emily, uh, they're both in bed sick. They hadn't got any results on their test yet, but and then a granddaughter of theirs is in bed sick. And then Brother Bud is in bed sick with fever and headache. And uh, I did call him between services and I said, can you smell and, and taste anything? And he said, yeah, I can smell and taste both. I said, well, that's good. And uh, he said, I took a Tylenol and a zinc pill and and uh, my fever has went down to 98.5, so he, he's feeling, he said, I'm feeling better. <laughs> but I told him we keep them in prayer. They shut their church, they shut church down today for uh, uh, because there's so many, there have several in their church that are sick right now. Uh, Texas, I'm sure most of y'all know that it, Texas has had a real surge in, in coronavirus cases, and so uh, they've, they're they just, you know, being extra careful. And when everything went back, you know, to people getting out, well, we pretty well knew there was going to be a surge at first, at least. And that's why I haven't started midweek services yet, and and I thought we would start it by now, but I'll just be honest with you, I'm not planning on starting until things level off a little bit. I just, I just think that we're all around different people during the week, and, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to be cautious for all of our sakes. I just think that we need to be, be cautious and be careful. And, and, uh, and then some of you... It's crazy, but some of people's business, some people are going out of business, and some people's businesses, like Brother Painter, uh, where he works at Lafferty, it's just exploded there, and he's just working, they're working hours, and, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people are doing that, and and even <laughs> even dog sales are up. I've got, I've got like 20-some-odd deposits on dogs that ain't even here, and... <laughs> I mean, people ain't got nothing to do but sit around and try to figure out how to spend money. Right now is a bad time to buy used cars. Did you know that? Used cars are selling like hotcakes and they're expensive. RVs are the same way. It's just right now. It's just it's amazing what you know what's going on in certain in certain facets of of uh, businesses in our country and and others are really hurting. Like, uh, is it Steinmart? I think my wife was telling me Steinmart's closing down. You know, it's just, it's just different businesses that way, and there's a lot of ma and pa operations that can't survive this. You know, it's just real tough on them. Huh? Chain, yeah, chain restaurants. And I keep forgetting these drive-in places. I keep getting out trying to go in, and I, I keep... Remember, you know, because the, the drive through lines are so long, I thought, I'll just go inside. You can't go inside. They don't, they don't let you inside. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, but in Bible study, uh, somebody, you know, I did, I did talk in Bible study on what, what is meant in the Bible by roaring lions. Roaring and ravening lions. And... Uh, 
it's obvious in every scripture in the, in the Bible that it's talking about. Uh, it's talking about Israel and wicked kings and wicked religious leaders. Uh, where Peter said, uh, your adversary, the, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom may, he may devour. And somebody mentioned to me, uh, two or three people mentioned to me, the fact that Jesus is also called the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's true, almost every, er, almost every element in the Bible, there's a good and a bad side about it. So, uh, but all these scriptures on a roaring lion. See, he was seeking whom he may devour. In the Old Testament, it's called a ravening and roaring lion. It's a, it's a devouring, ravenous beast. Uh, Jesus was the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he, there's a, there is a good power and a good uh, uh, strength in, in leadership, a righteous leadership. But it ain't, that's not what the roaring line of the Bible is talking about. And that's why I brought it up in Bible study because it's, it is talking about <clears throat> uh, in Peter's day there was such severe persecution that Israel that was against Christ and did not receive him as a Messiah with the strength of, of Rome was ravening against God's people in the body of Christ. They were, many of them being put in jail. Some of them were killed. All the apostles were martyred except for John. Uh, you know, and so it was a, it was a very dire time. And I went on and mentioned how, most of you were there, but I'm just saying for those of you who weren't there, uh, I went on and mentioned how that we are facing that in this country. We're facing a roaring lion spirit. I even prophesied and said this country will go to socialism. In fact, I'm not sure Trump can win this next election. I hope he does. I'm not, I'm not political as far as in fact, I'll just tell you, some of y'all won't agree with me on this. I've never voted since I've been in the body of Christ. The body taught against voting when I came in. And the way they taught it was is that God lifts up kings and he puts them down. The heart of a king is in the hand of uh, the Lord. And God's going to put in whoever, whoever he's going to put in. You can vote who you want to but I'll guarantee you he's going to put it in the minds of people to vote who he wants to put in. So he's running the world. I'm in the church. I'm not having nothing to do with the world and politics. But, you know, I've had men in the body tell me, well, if everybody felt like you did, well, where would we be? I said, we'd be right where we're at because God's running this thing. That'd be exactly where we're at. He's, he's going to put in who he wants to put in. And... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I know God works even in politics. I mean, Daniel, uh, he, was, he was in politics, wasn't he? Joshua, uh, yeah, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, but, but Daniel was the one that was uh, in the uh, civil, hooked up in civil leadership, but, but then uh, Joseph, you know, he run Egypt. For several years, but of course, when when the Pharaoh left over a period of time, they forgot about Joseph, and uh, and, and and the children of Israel became slaves. Yeah, Mordecai, same thing. Uh, in Esther's time, you know, she married a king. God, uh, uh, Nehemiah, and Ezra. They were involved. He was the king's cupbearer. And, uh, you know, God, the king gave him the power to go back to, to Israel and rebuild the temple. So God works in politics, but God was doing all that. It wasn't just a man made up his mind. 
that I'm going to go do this. You're talking about God, how God led his people and what God did in the world. And uh, so just like this coronavirus thing, you can mark it down that God is the source of this. You can just believe that. And you say, well, evil men brought it about in a conspiracy or however. He may have, but God's the one to put it in their mind. This ain't going on in this whole world and God not know what's going on. You, you ain't going to catch God unawares. He knows what he's doing. And go, if you read the Bible very much, you'll know that God is the one that brought enemies against Israel all down through time when they were wicked. He's the one that delivered them. He sometimes would, would come against them with other nations to humble them and get them to cry out to him. Then he'd turn to them. He's been working on men his whole life. And I can tell you right now, you think God don't know what this is doing to the body of Christ? This body is the most important thing in God's labor in this entire world. And you don't know that God... You can know. Let me just say that. I'm not going to accuse you of not knowing, but you, you have to know that God knows what's going on and He knew it would affect us. This body hadn't had a meeting since this took place. Yeah, He's shaking it, but it ain't, he, he just mildly shaking it because it ain't even close to shaking like it's going to shake. So, uh, the Lord is, He really is, uh, He's, he, there's a change coming, and and you know I even read the scripture. I talked, you know, I talked enough in script in, about in First Corinthians even about children. You know that uh, brother Durham brought up the scripture in Matthew 24 where God said, "Woe be unto them that give suck in those days." That's talking about the Jewish world back there, and First uh, Corinthians seven said. Uh, how did he say it? He said, those of you that are married, be as though you are not. In other words, he was basically saying, don't have no more children. I'm not telling y'all right now not to have no more children. I know Sister, where's Sister Chelsea? And I know she's had, this had affected her. She's pregnant. <laughs> so, you know, when a preacher starts talking like this, you get a little antsy, especially if you, you know, if it, if, if it gets close to home, I'm talking about the future, but I'm talking about probably near future. If, if my estimation, and I'm not the only one, of the restored church time frame being in, AD, in, in 2033, we've got, what have we got? 20... Uh, 13 more years. Really, we've got all, just a little, and you know, we got about 12 and a half. Less than that, okay. A couple months less than that. Before a restored church, and then we've got 15 years. <clears throat> so you're looking at 28 years. So, so who's a, Sister, where's Sister Ruth at? How old is Owen? He the youngest in here? Year old. So he'd be 29 years old when this 15 years, this 15 years takes place. So <clears throat> I'm just showing you how that civil power and religious powers, but but during that that last even the last whole 15 years there's going to be severe persecution as I mentioned I said what has to transpire yet is number one is America will have to become a dragon power which they're not we do not have full control of the world Brother Leninger used to say when you see America tax the rest of the world you'll know they're a dragon power well, and I agree with that, but did you know even Trump, is he's changed things in making other nations pay for the United States 
they confiscated the whole of over a, was it over a billion barrels of oil from that was being shipped to where was it going to uh huh Venezuela, Venezuela yes that's I couldn't get to work from Iran and uh they're going to keep it we're going to burn it you're going to put it in your cars Trump's not playing games with them he he you know he's he's uh He's changing things, and he's he's making sure that America's not just, you know, but but now our liberal side are wanting they're wanting to, the government to rule everything, which eventually that's going to happen. They're going to take over, and they are going to. Uh, it will become a dragon power. So America will have to become a dragon power shortly after that. We read in the 17th chapter. Put some of this up, Sister Claire, as you hear me talk about it. In the 17th chapter of the book of Revelations where it says that uh, this seventh head will, uh, how does it say that? But it'll rule for a short time, a short space. You look up short space, you'll find it. it's in the 17th chapter, verse 10, Revelation 17:10. I mentioned America's going to uh, I don't know if it's okay if y'all if I just sit because I'm having a little, I'm a little bit uh, unsteady with my equilibrium today so if it's okay I'll just keep sitting here for right now but uh, see there's seven kings five are fallen Egypt, Assyria, Babylon Medo-Persia and Greece and one is Rome, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. That's America. Not everyone in the body uh, agrees with that. But there has to be, it's going to speak in the 13th chapter. It tells us clearly that this head of the beast is going to speak as, with the same power, the one before it, and it's going to, it starts out with two horns like a lamb, but then it speaks as a dragon. So it is a dragon power, but it's not going to continue long. America is a is a been a great nation, and God's the one that devised democracy and put it in our forefathers' minds to develop this country under a new government called democracy. And or it may not have been the brand new, but it's the first time it's ever developed to a point that it built a nation like this that God would bless. And God had not blessed this nation because it's been so righteous. However, it has been more righteous than other nations. Our forefathers were God-fearing men. But God put it in their minds to establish this country and this government for the purpose of restoring His church. And... And God's been working on the restoration. You know, he started out with Martin Luther, but finally, before uh, and during the Protestant movement, God developed the United States of America, and this is where he brought the baptism of the Holy Ghost back into existence in his church. And this is where he called a man by the name of William Souders that got a vision that man didn't get a vision on his own. God gave him that. God's the one doing all of this and establishing his church and restoring it for another harvest. And, uh, of course, when I read, you know, woe be unto them that give suck or those that are, the, because the time is short, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, those that are married be as though you're not. He was saying that because back then Israel was fixing to go through the greatest devastation and one of the most terrible events that a nation ever went through. And I mentioned how that he, he, he told them, woe be unto them that give suck in those days. The reason he didn't want any more children to be born was is because those children were going to die. And they were going to suffer such great persecution, they did not have time to develop in the things of the Lord 
And I told how that, you know, they fled into the mountains. And if you had children, it was a lot harder for you to flee with your little children. But even after they got into the mountains, the Romans ran them out, ran them into the mountains. And after they got into the mountains, they cut them off. They couldn't get out of the mountains. They, they starved to death for food and water. And their little kids died and they ate those children. And they drank their own urine and ate their own dung to try to stay alive. No wonder God told them, don't have any more children. Because he knew what was going to happen. And, just like Amos said, God doeth nothing before first he reveals it to his prophets. The, Paul knew. The men of God back there knew and they told the people. Jesus knew, of course he did, and he prophesied of all what was going to transpire in, in Matthew 24. And there's prophecy for down here in the end of our world. Uh, if, if you look at the 15th chapter of the book of Revelations, we'll back up just a, a little bit in... in uh, the 14th chapter. Because the 14th chapter, beginning with the 6th verse, is completely dealing with the harvest of the end of the Gentile world. And in, in the 14th verse of Revelations 14, it says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, that's a restored church, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the throne, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. That's God reaping the righteous people from the earth. And verse 16 says, He that sat upon the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, or her grapes are fully ripe. See, there's, there's good fruit and there's bad fruit. And this is talking about bad fruit right here. And the earth thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress, this is also mentioned in, in Joel, the third chapter, the winepress was trodden without the city and became and blood came out of the winepress even to the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Of course, horses there is talking about churches. That's talking about uh, Babylon, the system of Babylon that winds up with all of God's. It's like an overflowing Jordan. God's going to, his wrath is going to be poured out on all that. Then verse 15 says, chapter 15 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now let, me, let me say this. I said, first, America is going to have to become a dragon power. Then in, in Revelation 13, it tells us that this two-horned beast that's going to speak as a dragon is going to make an image to the beast. So when America becomes a dragon power or a world power that runs the rules the world, it's going to make eventually an image to the beast. Now somebody asked me, he said, is now is are we going to suffer, you know, Muslim uh, the Mohammedism? Is that what's going to happen to us? No, not at first. At first, all of the systems of this religious world are going to come together with Roman Catholicism 
which the, will be the head, the eighth head of the B system, and it will rule the world once again for a period of time. It'll it'll be shortly lived too, and and uh, but and so that's what this is talking about is this this system. See, the 13th chapter shows what's going to happen. Then the 14th chapter shows there's going to be a restored ministry during this time that's going to harvest the righteous off the earth and make up the remainder of the bride. But then God's wrath also is going to be poured out on the rest of the world. All right? And so in the 15th chapter, it says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. These are people that uh, went through the type of the laver that in the restored, when the church is restored, even all of the truth, we don't even have the, all of the outer court finished up yet. But the laver will have the truth of the Word of God in it. It will purify and prepare people to go into the holy place. And the, that's who these people are ha, that had the harps of God. And they sung a song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. <coughs> that's the Old and New Testament. And the people of God are going to understand the Old and New Testament and be able to harmonize it. They'll be able to, to understand the whole and new text. It's like I was showing today, all of the ravening wolves and the roaring lion of the Old Testament. Peter understood all those scriptures. He knew what a roaring lion was, and he called them what they were and what God called them in the Old Covenant and used that, that terminology again uh, in the end of the Jewish world. <clears throat> Uh, it says, they sung this new song of Moses and the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for the judgments are made manifest. Thy judgments are made manifest. And after that, I look, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven was opened, and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen. That's, by the way, the righteousness of the saints. That's we're told that in the nineteenth chapter that this pure and white linen was the righteousness of the saints. And having their breast girded with golden girdles. In other words, your soul, your mindset is going to be girded up with the truth of the Word of God, which gold represents wisdom of God's Word. One of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. See, there's going to be come a time, just like in Noah's Ark, when God, God shut the door. There's going to come a time when nobody's going, no one is going to have an opportunity to make the bride or go into the holy of holies or even into the holy place. They can't enter the temple not during this time when God's wrath is being poured out. His wrath is going to be poured out on the world after he finishes his harvest of God's people. So then chapter 16 says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. And, and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men 
which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. <coughs> if you remember, if you'll, we'll go right back here in just a second, but if you go to the 14th, uh, 13th chapter of the book of Revelations, I think I'm just going to stand up. See if I, I'm getting feeling better all the time. Uh, here in the 13th chapter, uh, in the 11th verse, this is where it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. If you remember in the 13th chapter, in the first verse, it's John said, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and two horns. Well, <clears throat> All of these heads of the, these dragon power heads, world powers, what those seven heads are, they all developed out of the sea of humanity, not out of, not out of religion. They, they developed out of the sea of humanity, man's civil powers. But here is a total difference. This other, another beast coming up out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. It came out of the earth, not out of the sea. Right there, the earth in the book of Revelation represents religion, a religious power. That's why in the seventh chapter, you know, he said, don't hurt the earth or any tree, talking about righteous people, or the people in America that he's restoring his church in. God was was holding back the four winds until he seals his servants in their foreheads. And so <clears throat> here the earth is talking about the it's talking about America basically. America was developed out of the rest, restoration move or re, reformation movement starting with Martin Luther that eventually evolved to a place that God was able to send a people to the United States and start this country. And that, that, that he called that the earth. That, was, that, was, that, that came up out of something. See, the sea, if you look at the sea, it's the sea level. But everything that's in the earth is higher than the sea. It rises up out of the sea. Religion came up out of the sea. It's higher than just the world. It's an influence on people. The truth. The religion was developed out of some truth. America, God had his hand on the reformers to bring them to America to, to have a, a nation where he could restore his church and he blessed this nation above every other nation that ever was. And you or I are the most blessed people on the face of the earth in the Gentile world. Because we just happened to be born here and given an opportunity to serve the Lord God of heaven that was preparing an everlasting kingdom. You and I are blessed among everybody to have an opportunity to understand and have a vision of the body of Jesus Christ and what God is doing. You know, I'm not boasting, saints. I'm boasting in the Lord and what he's gave us. Do you know how many people, preachers in this world, can even talk about what we're talking about in this body? There's a lot of men in this body can't talk about these things. We need to be thankful for men like Brother Ray Leniger. God sent a prophet, and you and I got a chance to sit under him and to gain a knowledge and have imparted to us an insight to the future. Anyway, so going back to Revelation 16 now, remember I told you America is the culmination of the earth. This, this beast, two-horned beast that come up out of the earth. That's how it was established, out of religion, out of the people of God. And <clears throat> he said, I heard a voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your way, pour out the vials of wrath uh, of God upon the earth. 
And the first went out and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there was there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the uh, earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which had worshipped his image. God's going to judge this nation right here. That'll be the first vial that gets poured out. It'll be poured out on this nation right here because this nation is going to cause people to worship the beast and his image. They're going to set up his image and it's going to, it's going to turn this nation. It's turning right now as fast as it can turn. I hate it. I wish I could tell you something different. I wish I could prophesy something great to you that something great's going to happen. But I'd be a fool to do that and not warn you about what's coming in the future. And we're still, we're still living in a time where we still have time. You know, God's still blessing. We're still, this nation is still blessed. God hadn't poured His wrath out on it yet, but it's coming. The first vial is going to come out on this nation. And a grievous sore is going to hit this nation. I want to be... <laughs> You know, of course, I don't know, Sister Fisher. I don't know. You're you're getting up there with the rest of us, so you may we not we may not be here to see all this. But some of our ancestry and the younger ones are going to be here and see it and go through it. Those of you who can receive it and prepare yourself for, for it will make it through. Those of you who cast it off. And, and think that you can just ignore the Word of God and what the, 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 the ministry of God is trying to show you, you won't make it through. There's, there'll be a shaking. Just mark that down. You know, this nation, I mean, man, just think about, y'all know in the last three and a half years that we've had the lowest unemployment rate since the since the, the depression. We've had the greatest, we've never seen a, a Walmart stocks rise to what it rose to, to over 26,000. Did it ever get above that, son? Yeah, Dow Jones. But 26,000 something, 29, it got up to 29,000. You know what it was when when Obama went out, it was like 18, 19. That was, that, I don't think it ever hit 20 under any of our other presidents in my life. I mean, it just soared. This country was just exploding in blessings. Let me tell you something. The people that want to stop that, are, they'll, they'll do anything to stop it. They'll do anything to stop the conservatives. And liberalism is coming into this country as fast as you can imagine. And it's sad. It's just terribly sad. I know. I hope that enough of American people <clears throat> will wake up, or at least I hope that they don't buy what's being sold to them, and that we'll get another four years and have some more time before we have to endure that all this liberalism that's coming that's headed our way. I wish I could prophesy to you it's going to go away. But it, according to the Bible, it's not. Because this nation has, is wicked, just like other nations, it's turned against God. All this liberalism. I, mean, I remember when Obama, President Obama said, before I leave my office homosexuals in this country will have every right that anybody in this country has ever had. I'll see to it. I remember he was making that statement. I like to fell out of my chair. <clears throat> I don't know how long a man like me can get by with even making statements like that. Just, just rehearsing what's already been said by our leaders. But it's just showing you that men have no fear of God or the Word of God and, and they, they cannot even fathom the righteousness of God in our highest leaderships in office. 
Well, I'm thankful. I don't think President Trump is by any means a saint. But there's something about him that he's fearful of God's people or getting in God's way, and he's for the conservative Christians in America. And he wants to protect them. And one of the reasons, I think, is he knows back in his lifetime that this nation's been blessed because of our forefathers and the laws that they established in our nation and for the fear of God that's been in this country. And for whatever reason, I'm sure God's put it in his mind, he's holding to that conservatism. But it, I hope it'll hold up another four years, but I'm fearful for what might happen if it doesn't. Let's pray that it does. I mean, let's ask God. I think we ought to all be praying, God, give us another, a little more time. Would you, would you, would you give us a little more time? Would you let a few, your people, your people are humbling themselves and petitioning you to help us have a little more time. <coughs> anyway, verse 3 says, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. See, <clears throat> that happened in the early church when the third trumpet was poured out. Uh, it was the fourth trumpet when the what was the, what was uh, the bitterness that was added to the water? What was that called? Wormwood. Thank you. Uh, and, and many that were in the sea died <clears throat> back there. But here, everything in the sea, and the sea's the world. It's not none of God's people, it's the world, the ungodly that's in the world. Before God gets all his people <coughs> out of the world, he, he will, he's going to destroy everything that's in the world. They're going to be cut off. There's not going to be no more hope. God's drawn, he's going to draw a line. He's going to say, I'm judging this world. And everybody that's out in the world, <coughs> I'm going to judge them. He's going to pour his wrath out on them, and they're all going to die. Their soul. I'm not talking about killing them as an individual, but their soul. They'll be counted dead to God, and there's no more hope for them. God, God will give them an opportunity, and he's going to give them an opportunity through the body of Christ in the harvest in the end of this world that's talked about in the, in the 14th chapter. In the 14th chapter, there's going to be three messages. Fear God and give Him glory. That sounds simple, but it's a lot more to it than that. I can just tell you, me, you, or nobody that I know of fears God like they are to fear God. We don't recognize Him. His greatness, we haven't seen Him in a full manifestation yet, and we don't have the proper fear of God that we need to have. And we won't have it until God gives us greater power and demonstration of the Spirit and manifest Himself fully to us. You know, when Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead, you know what the Bible says happened? Fear fell on them all. God is going to bring judgment that's why I'm just going to tell you, you don't want restore, restoration in this country until we're ready for it. Because judgment's coming with it. There's not going to be no getting no more games. There's not going to be any more, you know, a lot of flexibility. God is going to, just like he said, just like Paul said when he was on Mars Hill in Athens, and he said, until now, God winked at these things. But now he's requiring every man everywhere to repent. And he was just showing the manifestation of God everywhere God men goes. You're either going to repent or God is going to judge you if you don't. If you don't straighten up, God's going to judge you. There was a time. See, God winked before that because God didn't have everything. Uh, he, he didn't, it wasn't time yet to judge everybody. What I'm reading about here, these seven vials gets poured out. It's a time of judgment that's coming on the earth. Y'all forgive me <laughs> if, it, it, if it stirs you up. And, but it needs to stir you up. Your mind needs stirred up. You need to know what's coming in the future. 
And, you know, I know when, when the Spirit comes on me to talk about this, I get, it's a, it's a sobering thing. It's a sobering time. I can't help it. It's my calling. It's part of my calling. Yeah, yeah, at this time, oh yeah, the church is not only restored, he's already made up, he's already had his harvest. He's made up his bride. There's nobody else going into the temple right now, not while these vials are being poured out and the wrath of God's being poured out. There ain't nobody else that can get in. Everybody that can get in has done got in. I want to be in that number. If I'm alive, I want to be in that number. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, what, how did... He said, go to ant, thou sluggard. You know, Jesus said, work what is yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work. That's going to happen down here too. It happened back there, it'll come. It'll happen down here. Verse 4 says, the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. These are people in Babylon that really do have a, they really do have a relationship with God, but they're in Babylon. And, and God, God's going to pour out His vial on them because they've been deceived and they gave over to that spirit and they did not give over to the, the harvest of God in gathering His people together. <clears throat> and God is, is going to judge that. <clears throat> you know, how does it say it? Uh... And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged this. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. That's, that's rough, isn't it? These are people of God that's going to wind up lost before it's over with, because they're going to join up with the beast system. And the wrath of God's going to get them. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with heat, great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over the plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. So the Word of God is going, you know, during this time, the Word of God's going to prevail in such a strong way that, I mean, God's judgment is going to come on this world that the world's never seen, nothing like it since the judgment that was on Israel, but it's going to be a, a, a more intense judgment that's going to reach out further than that early, uh, the Jewish world judgment reached, because the world's bigger. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of the pangs of their sores and repented of their deeds. See, God is not, he hasn't forgot the seat of the beast. He's going to, the seat of the beast is going to be judged. God's going to judge that system because it's a false system. And God is going to bring judgment on it. And the sixth angel poured out his vial, verse 12, upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. That's the ten kings. So you're going to, at first, when the ten kings, uh, when America goes down, <clears throat> America will have to go down before the ten kings can take over. <laughs> And y'all have heard me say it before. The only thing I can see right now that's going to take this place will be the United Nations. That's that for right now. That could change. Things could change between now and then. But right now, what I see is when when America goes down. The only thing I can see right now that can bring some measure of of uh, stabilization to the world will be the United Nations stepping in saying we're going to try to stabilize things. And at that time, those are, there, did y'all know there's more Arab nations in the United Nations in number and pop, than any other nation? 
There's where you're going to see Mohammedism come into effect. The beast, Roman Catholicism and the, that that joins up with it during the, the systems of this religious world, all the organizations of Christianity, that will rule during the eighth head. But after that's over, or after America goes down, the, there's going to be a preparation for the kings of the east. It's going to be during a, this last final judgment of these seven vials getting poured out. And that, <clears throat> that uh, when America goes down in judgment, these, <clears throat> these kings will rise up. And I, right now, like I said, I, it looks like to me it'll be the United Nations that will try to stabilize everything. And they'll agree with the beast. It tells us that in the uh, 17th chapter. And the way this works is, is you know, we, we, we get a revelation. In, I mean, we get like in a chapter, the Lord tells us something. Then he goes on for a little while. And then he says, okay, now well, let me go back and give you more details. Because what I was telling you about, I told you about those deals. But it's more going to happen during that time. So he goes back and begins to fill in the blank places or, you know, what's not seen at that time. And so <clears throat> there's going to be a, a way made for these kings of the east. Ultimately, it says that they will, they will eat. They'll burn her flesh. They'll devour her. In other words, those ten kings are going to destroy the beast system. They're going to destroy the market. And there's where I think you'll see Mohammedism. It's getting ready for that. <clears throat> see, God's going to use that. That's how God does. God judges wickedness with wickedness. He'll cause you to destroy yourself if you don't obey Him. And so <clears throat> he'll, he'll, He will judge us with righteousness, which will save us, but he'll, destroy, he'll pour out His wrath on wickedness to destroy wickedness. He'll use them. And they, they'll... they'll Burn her flesh. How's it, how's it say that? There in the 13th chapter. Um, it's in the 17th chapter, excuse me. He's, uh, They'll hate the whore and make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God's put it in her mind to do His will. See, God's going to use that to destroy the beast system. So... <clears throat> And there was voices. Uh, let's see if I got to that part yet. There were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as not since men were upon the earth so mightily an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nation fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's Babylon. There, there, there's, going to be, uh, there's going to be people in all of this religious world that's going to be elements, but those that are the very heart of Babylon, God, God is going to eventually, he's going to judge the seed of the beast and he's going to judge that, this Babylonian system. And verse 20 said, Every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. That, those are religious elements. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of the talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was so exceeding great. In other words, God is going to use a strong judgment to bring devastation upon this religious system that's disobeyed him and, and deceived his people. In verse seven, chapter 17, uh, And there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I'll show thee the whore. Oh, I, I see, I think I left out one, didn't I? Mm. Yeah, the, well, I didn't leave it out, but this, the every island, mountains fled away and there fell upon men great hell. Uh, it's going to end, it will end with uh, Armageddon. That it, the, these seven vials will end with the battle of Armageddon. 
he goes back in the 17th chapter and starts explaining um, he starts explaining the beast and the harlot system. See, he, that's where he, he goes back again and starts saying, all right, let me give you some more information here. And he does that in the 17th chapter, and then he gives more information in the 18th showing how God is going to judge Babylon, how first he's going to get all his people out of it. But <clears throat> anyway, I just thought I would mention, you know, what's got to transpire again America has to become a, 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 a dragon power. The mark of the beast is going to have to be set up. Uh, the religious world is going to come together. God's going to have to get all of his people out of Babylon before all these seven vials are going to get poured out. We've we got a lot of work to do. This body's got a lot of work to do in a short time to get there, <laughs> to get it done. And then after God gets his people all out of that, he's gonna, it's going to take time to make up his bride and finish making up the bride before he does this. And then he's going to pour out his wrath upon this world. And if all of that's going to take place in the next, what did we say, 20, let's see, 50, 28 years? That's, that'll go by pretty fast. In fact, it's going to happen before that because I'm going to say it's about the last seven years that these legs are going to get, these plagues are going to get poured out. The first seven years, he's going to make up his bride. I'll tell you why I'm saying that. Because the, the temple, just like in the eighth chapter, in the eighth chapter, after the sixth and seventh chapter is, is revealed in the, in the, uh, horses and, and the seven seals. In the seventh chapter, everything ends up, you know, it's just a short synopsis of everything ending up with God harvesting the world and making up his people in the everlasting world. Then the eighth chapter, he starts all over, and he sa- and how it starts all over, it starts off saying, and there was silence in heaven for a, the space of half an hour. That's talking about when Jesus came to that world back there, the temple was built in a half an hour. It's symbolic, time frame wise. If you go back to the seventh chapter of First Kings, you'll see that it took Solomon seven and a half years, exactly seven and a half years to construct the temple. And that's a half hour. And that symbolic type of the fact that the early church came on the day of Pentecost in Jesus' ministry, in a symbolic half hour, there was silence in heaven. Remember when the temple was built, there was not to be a sound of the hammer on the temple site. It was silent. God did not let no man's work and no man's sound do it. It was done by God. And before we can get this accomplished down here, there's going to be silence in heaven for a half hour. Symbolically, God is going to restore his church. It'll be the work of God that'll get it accomplished. And then, and that is going to reap God's remainder of the bride and then he'll pour out his vials. I won't say, that's just symbolic. I'm not saying the exact moment of time but I'm just showing you the Bible does give us all of these symbols and all of these things that gives us some understanding of what God's going to do. Anyway, hallelujah. Let's do something else religious. <laughs> yes? Okay. He'll deal with every every child he's got in the world that's backslid and went back out in the world that's left the body that's anywhere. He'll do this manifestation of God is going to shake God's children to a point to cause them to come back to God. And if they reject that, that is blasphemy that there's no forgiveness in. That was the blasphemy in the early church Jesus was talking about. Is when you could argue, you could talk against Jesus, but you come against the, the Spirit of God. And that's the manifestation of God in its fullness, 
and you reject that, there is no hope for you. Well, we don't, you know, it's not left up to us to judge it. It's the Lord, but but there, God is going to reach out and touch them and bring them in, and they will have an opportunity to make the bride. But everybody's not going to make the bride. I mean, I'd like to just say everybody's going to make it. But somebody, some people don't have, they're not, you know, they just, they're not going to sober up enough to make it. You know, they, it may take resurrecting in the, in, in a, I, although if they stay here in this, I don't think they'll even come up in the unjust. But there's some people that will die, probably God will let them die, before uh, the bride's made up and they'll probably still come up in the unjust. They just didn't have the wherewithal or possibly the time with their ability. It may take another, it may take another operation of God to bring them in. I don't know. I can't. De- declare exactly what God's going to do, but I do know this, just like in Israel, God gave every one of His people an opportunity to come into the body of Christ, and the biggest majority of them rejected it. No. If, if, if you reject the sevenfold light and the greatest manifestation that God could show you. What would be a sense of bringing it up? Show it to you again. If you rejected it, you're going to reject it again. You're going to go down, come up the same spirit you went down with. There's a lot of people that's left this church and won't come back in. I can tell you that right now. Some people just have not got a spirit. Some people's spirit are so rotten that you can't tenderize them. But We have never seen a full manifestation of God yet, and that's going to change a lot of things. That's going to, I'll guarantee you this, there'll be people come back that you never thought they could come back. Brother Mark? No, we're doing the hammering right now. I'm hammering right now today. We're hammering, we're beating out stones, we're chipping off the rough edges, we're getting them fitted to fit. But when the, when the church is restored, there be a there will be a silence in heaven as far as putting the temple together. Huh? No, no, we're still in the 30-year period. In that first seven and a half years, is going to make up the bride with a restored church, with a temple already built. Temple will be built when the church is restored, and it's going to take a time of that manifestation of God and operation of God and the full truth of God to cause people to overcome and reach perfection. It'll take time. But when they make it, you know, Stephen made it just a few just a few years. Uh, well, I'm not putting an exact time on it, but we know it's going to take time, and I don't think it's going to take 15 years for him to pour out his wrath. So, but it's going to take time to pour out wrath and judge this whole system. So, but I, the bride will be made up because nobody's going into heaven. While, these, while this wrath is being poured out in these seven vials. So the bride's got to be made up before that. So... The 
No, I'm saying the silence occurs before the bride is made up, just like it was in the early church. See, look in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation, <clears throat> just real quick. I know what y'all saying. You saying, "Oh God, we got him started again." But no, I, it's going to take but a second. In the eighth chapter is what I want. See how it starts out? It's starting all over because he's already ended everything. God's wiped away all tears from every eye, and the Lord's righteous. You know, He's dwelling among His people. But then in the eighth chapter, he starts again. It says, "And when he had opened the seventh seal." There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God and to them that, giveth, uh, that were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints, the golden altar which is before the throne. Well, see, it started off with there was silence in heaven before the trumpet sound. Jesus sounded the trumpet. But he brought with him a divine order of God, which was a silence in heaven that there was a completeness in Christ. In him the fullness of the body dwelt. Uh, the head of God dwelt. The Godhead. And, and, and so there, the temple was established. On the day of Pentecost, it was established. It was, it was available, the holy place. But it took time for people to overcome during that, during that time after the day of Pentecost. That's what I'm saying. When the church is restored down here, there won't be a sound of the hammer. There will be silence in heaven again. The church will be restored. And then we, there, will, there will be the bride. It will take time for the bride to be made up. And then God will pour out his wrath before that 15 years is up. And it'll end in Armageddon. That's gonna that ends the Gentile world, and so you know it'll it'll be the millennium will start in after the bride's made up. And of course, they'll the bride will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, plain as mud. <laughs> no, no. Listen to me. It's it's symbolic. Okay, it was symbolic that the, the church, see, all of the chipping at the stones and preparing them had to take place in the quarry. That's where we're at right now, restoring the church and preparing the temple to be built and be put together in a restored church. That's just a picture. Silence in heaven just means this is not a work of man. This is a work of God. Right now, we're working, laboring, trying to develop the truth and Trying to God trying to help us get things restored. Once God's got us in a place, He says, "All right, the church is is in a restored condition, and I, you know, I'm ready to I'm ready to harvest." That's that was silent. Then silence. That silence in heaven. God's going to do the work from then on out. I'm just going to tell you right now, there ain't a preacher living that can take us beyond the restored church. It's going to have to be God all the way, and we're going to have to be have to be men that can be led by the Spirit and do the will of God. It's going to take that. It's it's not going to be men trying to promote their doctrine. It's not going to be men trying to build their systems or their kingdom. It's going to be men that are fully yielded over to God and given over to the work of God, and that <clears throat> that's what the temple will be built by God having men that He can use. It's His work. And there ain't no man's hand going to lay on it. That's what silence meant. Those, there's not a man that can chip at those stones. There's not a man that can par, compar, prepare them. It's going to be the work of God through a ministry that's totally yielded to him that's going to make people a part of that temple. So it's just symbolic. I don't see how you can put it any other way. You can't, you can't put a time frame hardly on that. It has to be... You know, it has to be just like I just read there. There was that, it, when you read that, it only make a lick of sense. It took me twenty five years to understand that first verse. I, I never could understand it. One day, God said, "I got it." You know, I read it, and the Lord dropped that in my in my sack. You know, got a little nugget there. The Lord did that for me. Well, 
I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful I understand that because I didn't understand that for years. Anyway, let's don't get this offering out of our sight. <laughs> we still got to pay the bills. What time is it anyway? What is it? Oh, Lord. Well, here, Brother Fisher, come up here and take the offering from me. <laughs> I'm going to get to sit down. I'll get off on something else. Well, I can say is praise the Lord that we are hearing that message today Amen. about what's coming out before us. And uh, we've seen everything on the news and everything else. Um, it's, it's beautiful to be able to hear these things and it's comfort. So let's go ahead and as Brother Smith said, let's do something real religious right now. So uh, he had already taken up some um, requests. So uh, if we'll go ahead and stand, the ushers will come forward. We'll receive the tithes and offering. Um, we had those different requests mentioned. Let's not forget those from Brother Bud, Nacogdoches Church, and Brother uh, Shelby's family and the different ones. So um, let's stand and take these knees before the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for these blessings that you've given us, the understanding that you're giving to the body of Christ, dear God. Lord, we want to get closer to you in this time, dear Jesus. Have your perfect work in us, Lord. Judge our life before you, dear God. We appreciate you, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you bless this offering here today, Lord, as the people give their tithes and offerings for you, dear God, for your great work in this day. We appreciate you and for everything that you do for us, dear God. All the different ones that have been mentioned, Lord Jesus, we ask, Lord, as our great comforter, our mighty God, that you hear these needs that we have. God, we bring them before you as you know them before we have even asked. Dear God, we love and appreciate you so much, Lord. We thank you, God, for this opportunity, Lord, to come to you, wonderful Savior, Lord to cover us the rest of this week. Thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father. Bless your name. Bless your name.